Hi, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we have a very special uh, webinar with uh, Dr. Susan Aris and uh, Dr. Robert uh, Dalhousing. Today, we are going to be revisiting um, avian bornavirus. Um, you might have caught our previous webinar. Hopefully, you did. If not, it's on our YouTube. Um, it's on the YouTube channel for the fever. Um, so, what we have going today is um, we've got these uh, two wonderful and very knowledgeable vets. Uh, who are going to go through the questions that have been pre-sent to us about um, this really important um, uh, disease. And just a reminder to everybody that today we're not answering the live Q&As. Um, we already have questions that, that, we're, uh, that they're gonna address. So, um, so we won't be doing the, the live Q&A today. And this is a very, um, um, we wanna get, make sure we get through all the questions and the presentations. So, I, so we're pretty much gonna dive right in off the bat here. Um, and with that said, uh, I'm going to let you guys take it away. Um, we already got the presentation here locked and loaded. So, so if you guys want to um, go ahead, it, we'll go with that. All right. Well, um, Bob, you'll have to go to the first screen. I can only just see it. So yeah, there we go. So okay. um, when we're talking about avian ganglion neuritis, we that, that's a word and an understanding of, of a disease that we, we didn't know a lot about. And we first found it, or heard of it, I should say, um, in macaws. And this is a slide that was taken um, when I was in practice. Uh, this was a picture from 1983 that I bummed off of uh, Ron Ridgway and Gary Gowerstein. I started in their practice in 1984 um, in California. And this was one of the first macaw um, that was presented in California um, with this thing that we called macaw wasting disease. So the birds um, were wasting, they had undigested poop um, and they just wasted away and they died. And so we found that on radiographs, they had a dilated proventriculus or part of the stomach. And so it was first called a PDD, a proventricular dilatation disease. And that um, has morphed to a much better understanding, but it's only taken 30 plus years to get there where we talk about avian borne viral disease. And so we're, today we're gonna talk about avian borne virus and the disease, but I as a neuro person, um, and I was talking to Laura here originally, my first life I was and uh, I was really involved in neuro, uh, neuroanatomist at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine teaching medical students, neuro. And I think the better term would be avian ganglioneuritis because what you see is, is different in different birds and in, in different individuals, but all of them will have inflammation of nerve ganglia and ganglia are the cell bodies of nerves. So I think it's better to call it avian ganglion neuritis. Go ahead, go ahead, Bob. Okay, thank you, Susan. Um, I think the important thing here too on this slide is that avian borne viral disease, while it was attributed to avian borne virus, we can have avian ganglion neuritis without the presence of the virus. So, um, I think even ganglioneuritis is a more appropriate term because it better uh, defines the pathology that's occurring in the bird. We're having an inflammation of the nerves of the, you know, directed to the nerve ganglioside proteins. And the clinical disease that we see really is dependent on a number of factors. First, the host species that's involved um, and, and uh, this can be like an old world species cockatoos. We tend to see more central nervous system signs in new world species, um, macaws and conures and so forth. We'll tend to see more autonomic nervous system signs and gastrointestinal signs. African gray parrots are a little different. We see CNS, the seizures, but we're also tend to see more peripheral nervous system signs. So. The bottom line on avian ganglion neuritis is the distribution of lesions, uh, depending if it's a central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, autonomic nervous system, and the severity of the lesions um, that occur is really going to determine what you will see clinically with this disease. The um, 
classic disease is the, you know, McCall wasting disease that Susan described, um, where we have digestive tract, the proximal GI tract involvement. Yeah, right. And so Bob has a picture right there that shows this very dilated, but thin, thin walled uh, proventriculus that you see here. And this is when I was talking to Dr. Ritchie a long time ago, because there's the thinning of the nerve, uh, sorry, thinning of the muscle, which is a consequence of a problem with the nerves going to the muscle. And that is controlled by the dorsal vagal nucleus. And then from the autonomic nerve system, the ANS, that's the autonomic nervous system, we see a problem with the right side of the heart because there's more innervation from the vagus nerve on the right side than the left side of the heart, also in the adrenal gland. So when pathologists in the old days, when we were trying to figure out this disease, they would take, they'd always want you to take samples of the adrenal gland. And then from the central nervous system, um, Dr. Dahlhausen has alluded to the fact that we can have central nervous system signs. So central signs are things that relate to things like not feeling where our body is in three-dimensional space. We have trouble balancing. And because we have trouble balancing, we have ataxia. We, we don't know where our feet are or our wings are or our body is. Um, I've had birds uh, with cortical blindness, either because the, the image is scrambled in the, in the occipital lobe of the cortex or because it's affected the retina. We also have birds with seizures. And then, then as Bob said, with particularly African grays, but not always just African grays, that the nerves going to the body wall can also be affected that portion from the thorax to the lumbar. And it can create some of these um, birds that have um, feather damaging behavior and self mutilation as a consequence of neuritis. Nerves are inflamed, and the bird is just desperate to get rid of that, that those pains, whatever they are. And in humans, they would be like shooting pains, very, very terrific pain that they're trying to get rid of. Go ahead. This was an African gray here um, that you can see here. Uh, as a patient of mine, this bird. The only thing we saw was picking at the level of the skin in this region. This bird literally fell off the perch and died. Uh, the owner said, my bird had a heart attack. We did histopathology on it, and the lesions were seen in the cardiac muscle, mainly the right side of the heart. And as uh, Susan alluded to with these lesions in the uh, thoracolumbar spinal cord, a lot of these birds that tend to uh, feather pick at the level of the skin and self-mutilate, you can see this cockatoo here, you can see all the little scabs here from the picking, this African gray on its legs. These lesions are located in the sensory uh, portion of the spinal cord, dorsal root. Is that correct, Susan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I'd like to point out something. What, what Bob is showing you here is that there's a little receptor there. There's a, a receptor in the skin. And, and these birds are literally trying to get rid of that receptor. That's why you get those black spots or something. They're literally picking that out because of the alteration of sensation. I mean, there's other reasons that birds get feather damaging behavior. This is just one of them, okay? So just because the bird's plucking doesn't mean that it has avian ganglion neuritis. It could, and it could have that and something else, you see? So there's a lot of gray and there's much less black and white than you would think. Go ahead. Exactly. Um, these birds that pick at the level of the skin like we see in these two images, uh, that tends to be more um, organic. There, there's something going on in the bird sensation, but we will see avian ganglioneuritis cause birds to feather pick. These birds that tend to be hyper responsive to environmental stimuli and that become very nervous. And as a result, we see these behaviors where they actually V-notch feathers in that. And those feathers that are present, I mean, there's no life in them once they're in, there's no nerves, no blood supply. This is a psychogenic behavior, but it can be driven by the avian ganglion neuritis. 
Um, another uh, aside that I wanted to include in here, a lot of these birds, even cockatoos that tend to show the lower brainstem signs, they still have, if you run histopathology, you'll find lesions in the digestive tract. What I see is a lot of these birds will come in and if we look at the feathers, the barbules in that are pretty much absent. And if you look closer, I mean, you can almost see through these feathers. So very, very poor structure to, uh, and feather quality in these birds. So if you see this clinically, um, you've got to thank avian ganglion neuritis. And Bob, that, that yeah. other bird, if you go back, um, that one, one more, um, you can see how there's there's issues with the legs, um, lower, you yeah. know, either, yeah, in the lower brainstem, which we're talking about is cerebellar, probably where the, the bird doesn't know where its feet are in three-dimensional space, probably, is that what you saw in this particular guy? He was- Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay, so avian borne virus, I'd like to talk a little bit about this virus because it's uh, obviously it's come to the forefront. And uh, we, we, we know that presence of the virus can induce disease in birds, uh, especially when experimentally we expose them to large amounts of this virus, higher than anything they're gonna be exposed to in their normal environment. And, um, we're, we're producing disease in these birds that we normally, you know, from a clini clinician standpoint, we don't see very commonly. So, um, and the isolation of avian borne virus in that, um, yes, it's involved with avian ganglioneuritis. It is a cause of avian ganglioneuritis, but it's important to keep in mind it's not the only cause. We know this virus tends to replicate in the cell nucleus of the host, so that hides it from the host immune system. Mm -hmm. It's very highly neurotropic. And so as a result, it tends to cause these very persistent asymptomatic infections. And it, it, it's pretty much thought today that once a bird's infected with this virus, it's like herpes, they're infected for life. We know that when we look at um, testing uh, for the avian bornavirus RNA infection rates, uh, they're pretty high. It's very widely distributed, both in captive and wild populations. Michael Lertz did a study of 59 normal healthy birds coming into their clinic for yearly exams. 45.8% of those birds were positive for the avian bornavirus. In another study with known PDD in that aviary, again, 45% of those birds were positive. We took samples that were sent to us in the lab for other testing. We had just under 800 samples and 271 of those samples were positive for the avian borne of ours. We had a rate of about 34%. When they surveyed aviaries across Europe, about a 23% infection rate. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the rate in wild waterfall, in canaries, if you look at it in wild birds in South America, wild citizens, approximately 30% of these birds are infected with the avian borne virus. So, you know, I tell clients, if you have three birds, you've got borne virus. You know, it's pretty much present in almost any aviary or any avian collection um, that exists. So talk a little bit about transmission because this is very important for understanding. We get a lot of questions about, I had a bird that was positive, are all my other birds gonna die of PDD? I mean, questions like that, we get that all the time. Avian borne virus, we know it is shed in the urine and the, the feces. And so initially it was thought that this was a urofecal oral route of uh, infection. Um, as we see in a lot of other common viruses like um, herpes virus, cytosine herpes virus, um, polyomavirus and so forth. Um, but studies have really shown that this horizontal route of transmission um, by direct contact among birds is really inefficient, especially in birds that are immunocompetent. We're talking, you know, birds uh, that have been weaned and hand fed and weaned and uh, up through adults. 
there was an interesting study at Texas A&M where they cultured live um, uh, avian borne virus four from cockatiels that were sick. They inoculated these birds both orally and through an intranasal route to simulate inhalation. Not a single one of those cockatiels converted to a positive status. So inhalation and ingestion are not effective routes of transmission. The other thing to consider with this is that the avian borne virus is very, very unstable outside of the host. It lasts hours and we're talking, you know, six hours or less, and that's under really ideal conditions. Um, so the fact that a bird is shedding it and, you know, another bird in the aviary is gonna pick it up, looking at the instability of the virus and the fact that either through ingestion or inhalation, the virus really doesn't infect birds. Um, it's not one of these viruses that's gonna be readily transmittable, okay? There was an interesting study uh, from Texas A&M where Jordan Gentry infected lovebirds. He gave it orally and intramuscularly. Lovebirds are very resistant to this infection. None of these birds develop clinical disease and he used um, uh, avian borne virus two and four, genotype two and four. The virus was present. They could, they could detect the virus in two out of six birds, but those are the ones that were given by intramuscular injection. Other studies- And, and high doses, right, Bob? Those are pretty high, high doses. High doses, that's the other yeah. thing you understand, very high doses, which normally a bird, any bird, I mean, I don't care if there's if they're sharing the same cage, they are not exposed to this level of virus. Cockatiels, though, if they're given it by intramuscular injection, intravenous injection, or intracardiac injection, all become positive and they all become diseased. Okay. So what we have here is that this virus is not one that is readily transmitted in the environment among birds as would occur in an aviary situation where you have normal adult immune competent birds. And, and, I, and I qualify that because there was an exception where a clinically diseased bird was put into a nursery where we had birds that weren't, in, weren't immune competent and a lot of them went on to develop clinical PDD, okay? But the interesting thing about that is they develop disease when they become start to become immune competent. In other words, when their immune system starts to function completely, that's when we see the disease. And uh, Susan, I know you were in on this conversation with our <laughs> Dave oh, boy, was I? Gerlach. <laughs> what a wonderful lady. Um, and, and in 2007, she stated PDD is transmitted through the patellin membrane of the egg. <clears throat> and um, we, both Susan and I were involved in an aviary that was supplying a large number of birds to the pet shop trade. And these birds, these they were young birds and they were showing up with clinical avian ganglioneuritis. And we went back, they, were, they had a band, we traced them back to the aviary and the aviary said, well, that's impossible because all these chicks are pulled from, we pull the eggs and artificially incubate them, okay? Well, what that did was that that confirmed that this virus is vertically transmitted through the egg. It qualified what Helga Gerlach was telling us in 2007. I had a situation with uh, breeding parakeas here at a zoo. Um, both parents were ABV positive. We tested 23 eggs that didn't hatch. They, they would pull eggs and artificially incubate them. Had a lot of problem with babies when they're around three months of age developing clinical uh, central nervous system signs. 22 out of those 23 eggs tested positive for avian borne virus. And uh, there was a recent uh, research that was uh, presented by Michael Leertz um, at our last um, uh, meeting here, uh, documenting vertical transmission of this virus. So I think we're, we're gonna find that this virus is, um, the, the main route of transmission is vertically, and it's not from adult bird to adult bird. <clears throat> so um, when we talk about boronavirus, there, we've got one out of three birds that the virus is present. It's present in healthy birds. 
But a lot of these birds, in fact, the majority of these birds show no signs of clinical disease. And we need to assume that this infection is lifelong, just like herpes virus. It evades the host immune system and it will persist. And we know that stress, especially reproductive stress, can cause this virus to activate, cause problems, and then we get this immune autoimmune disease and avian ganglionitis occurs. And um, our colleague, Dr. Rossi, um, back in, it was Belgium, I think, one when he did his presentation, um, he brought this, the similarity of avian borne viral disease or avian ganglionitis, compared it to Guillain-Barre syndrome in humans. And this is where the host mounts an immune response to its own nerve ganglioside proteins. And we see problems in Guillain-Barre, we see this ascending paralysis in people. I know that firsthand, my wife got vaccinated. Um, I think it was a flu vaccine at uh, Ohio State. She was an RN there. And within days, she actually became completely paralyzed and couldn't walk. And luckily she recovered from that. So this uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is very, very similar to the autoimmune disease we see in avian ganglionitis. When we talk about the pathogenesis of this, we know that ganglionitis can be induced by the virus invading the host cells. And I'll show you a slide here in the process. In this process where it invades the host cell, it exposes the normally sequestered nerve ganglioside proteins. And here you can see the virus here, you know, uh, attacking this nerve cell and entering this nerve cell. Again, it's a nervous neurocentric um, virus. And a little closer, you see the virus here and you see the receptors that attach to these nerve ganglioside and pull these nerve ganglioside, then expose them to the nerve, to the uh, host immune system. We also have another process that you have to keep in mind on the pathogenesis of avian ganglioneuritis, and that's called molecular mimicry. This is where the host immune response to other viruses, other bacteria, cross-react with host nerve ganglioside. Probably the best example is GI tract infections with Campylobacter jejuni. Certain strains of Campylobacter will cause the host to mount an immune response. And through this ganglioside mimicry, we have both T cell and B cell response. These B cells produce host antibody, which then cross-react with the nerve ganglioside, and we get disease, we get inflammation of those nerves, okay? So this is a slide from uh, Dr. Rossi. Avian borne viral infection is just the tip of the iceberg. And through either direct or indirect damage from this virus, we can expose these ganglioside proteins through the autoimmune mechanism. We get an immune response that attacks the host nerves, okay? And that gives us our avian ganglioneuritis or PDD pathology. But in addition, through antigenic mimicry, Campylobacter infections, chlamydia, certain strains of chlamydia, mycoplasma, haemophilus, and then viruses, we're talking herpes virus, paramyxovirus, which is in the same family as avian borne virus and influenza virus, all can produce antibodies in the, in the host that cross-react with the avian ganglioside with the immune ganglioside. Um, this is kind of an example of some of these listed here. Mycoplasma, the ganglioside, GM1, which is pretty common. Haemophilus, also GM1, uh, GT1B. We got paramyxovirus, orthomyxovirus, herpes virus, Campylobacter, both the GM1 and GT1. These are the G GM1 and GT1 are the common ones that we see involved in avian gang. Uh, gang and, and let me just point out here that that those ganglioside are in high concentrations in certain parts of the central nervous system. Okay, so that's why we get symptoms that relate to the parts of the brain that have those particular ganglioside. That, that's oh. why, why you see that. Exactly. To um, test this theory, Dr. Rossi 
took eight cockatiels that were negative for avian borne virus um, through PCR testing, and he inoculated these birds with a mixture of avian gangliosides, which also was negative for the avian borne virus. Some three of these birds were given it intraocularly and orally. Three birds were given it by injection intraperitoneally, and two birds were given uh, just a, a phosphate buffered saline control. Within one month, 100% of the injected birds, the intraperitoneal injected birds, developed CNS and GI tract signs compatible with PDD or avian ganglion neuritis, and one third of them of the oral infected birds did. Four out of six of these birds, the crop biopsies showed the exact same histopathologic lesion that we see with PDD. So basically what Dr. Rossi did was produce avian ganglioneuritis without the presence of the avian borne virus. We know that avian ganglioneuritis, and again, this is a better term for this disease. It's an autoimmune inflammatory disease. Where the immune reaction occurs determines what we see clinically. As Susan mentioned, the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system will see associated GI tract dysfunction, neurologic signs. The, the cerebrum will tend to see things like uh, uh, cortical blindness, the cerebellum, ataxia, proprioceptive deficits. And in the spinal cord, we'll tend to see uh, problems like the self-mutilation and that, that, that I And that's because to. those those gangliosides that are very commonly affected by the by the coronavirus and this molecular mimicry, they're in those regions. Okay, right. that that's why. Mm -hmm. Correct. The disease that we're gonna see, okay, it really depends upon several factors. Number one, the gangliosides that are recognized by the host immune system. And there's about, there's over 50 of these in the body. And the distribution of these gangliosides varies from bird species to bird species. And I think this is why we tend to see differences between cockatoos and conures and macaws and so forth in African grays. So the neurologic distribution, the gangliosides in the host, okay, the gangliosides that are recognized by the immune system and the severity of that immune reaction is going to determine the disease that's observed. That's a very important point to understand here. Any infection that exposes nerve gangliocide proteins to the host, to the host immune system and elicits a suitable immune response can produce disease that is compatible with PDD, avian ganglioneuritis, whether or not avian borne virus is present. So, and, and I think it's also important to point out the fact that it's be, because you can see here that the symptoms are different. When you call it PDD, you're just, you're just discussing the proventriculus and the dilation associated right. with it, and you see other things. So go ahead, Bob. I, I love this slide from Giacomo Rossi. If it is true that avian borne virus infection is a cause of PDD, it is equally true that ABV is not the only cause of PDD. And if you take anything away from this lecture, you need to keep that in mind because we have many causes of this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about testing birds, okay? We have basically two tests. Uh, we're coming out with another test that I'm working on here. I'll explain that in a minute, but the, the PCR, all that does is it, it detects the avian borne virus RNA uh, in whole blood, tissue swabs, and colloidal swabs, okay? We like whole blood because avian borne virus is intermittently shed in the droppings. If you just do a fecal swab, you can get false negative test results because the virus is only there intermittently. If it's dormant in the cell nucleus, you're not gonna pick it up. And there have been many times through techniques that we've developed in my lab, where we pick it up in the blood circulating and it's negative on the swab, okay? This, this is kind of arbitrary, but we really think that you need at least three negative tests, both whole blood and clinical swabs. I would take them two weeks apart to really have some degree of confidence that that bird does not have avian borne virus RNA in its body. 
And, and I'd also add that it's always better to take those samples if the bird is during its hormonal phase of its exactly. yearly cycle. Time of year is very, very important. Right. Yeah, critical. Mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind is that the avian borne virus is very, very unstable. Yeah. It's an RNA virus. It gets chopped up by these RNA aces that are everywhere. So in clinical samples, we can have a, a sample that's really a hot positive today, seven days later, it tests negative. So it's very <laughs> imperative that you get these samples to the lab and that they're tested immediately. Don't send them in on a Thursday or Friday and they sit through the weekend and they're tested Monday. Get them in at the beginning of the week, okay? But that's just for avian borne virus testing. More importantly, if we have a bird that is showing neurologic disease, okay, or any disease that can be related to some dysfunction of the nervous system, be it central, peripheral, autonomic, you need to think about avian ganglion neuritis. And that's where this AGAA, anti-ganglioside antibody assay, comes into play. This is an ELISA assay, and what it does is it detects antibodies to the nerve ganglioside's. And we have a mixture, we have purified GM1, GT1B, and then a mixture of cytosine nerve ganglioides that are used as antigens in this testing. And this will confirm that avian ganglioneuritis is occurring as a disease process in what you're seeing in, this, in a bird with neurologic signs, regardless whether bornovirus is present or not. And the only... Uh, uh, problem with this assay is yeah. that some some seriously ill birds, if these birds come in, they're so emaciated, so depressed, their immune system function is shot. A lot of them don't really develop detectable antibody levels. And that's the only problem we've seen so far. But if you got a bird in pretty decent condition and it's just starting to show signs and we'll talk about um, how best to manage this in birds, um, if you get them tested with this assay, the assay is really, really shown excellent correlation. Um, here's a, a result uh, from a study that Rossi and Michael Lertz had shown, published. They had 28 uh, deceased parrots, four of which died with histologic histopathology that was compatible, that proved PDD, okay? They did PCR on those for bornovirus. They did a bornoviral um, antibody test and an anti-ganglioside antibody assay. Of those four birds that had his, histopathology of PDD, four were positive for avian bornovirus PCR. Only one had avian bornoviral antibody, but four had anti-ganglioside antibodies. Um, and none of these birds that had lesions um, and four of, four of those were positive for the bornovirus, but they had no lesions. Four of them had antibodies to bornovirus. None of them had lesions. None of them had anti-ganglioside antibody. And then we had some with uh, antibodies to bornovirus, but the PCR was negative. They were negative. The pathology was negative on these and negative here, both um, some were positive on PCR, some negative, but negative on anti-ganglioside. Bottom line, if you got lesions, have lesions in a bird that are compatible with avian ganglioneuritis, this test will pick it up. Rossi observed a 98% correlation between anti-ganglioside antibodies and histopathologic lesions of avian ganglioneuritis. So um, before we get into questions here, we're gonna talk a real quickly about treatment. This was the first bird that was treated for um, confirmed PDD. This bird had um, confirmed PDD in the aviary, did crop biopsy here. You can see the lesion from it. You see the large crop on this bird. Um, this was a, a fellow that lost several macaws from PDD avian ganglioneuritis came to me and said, look, we got to do something. He said, this is my favorite pet. I cannot lose this bird. So I looked closely at the, the histopathology that occurred. It was a non-separative inflammation of the nerve ganglia. And I went through um, reading different pharmaceuticals 
The Celebrex came up. It was a specific COX-2 inhibitor, and that's important. We'll explain that in a minute. Had really high bioavailability orally, achieved high concentrations in the GI tract. So we put this bird on an arbitrary dose of Celebrex. We did 20 megs per kg orally twice a day for three months. This is the initial radiograph on that bird. You can see the enlargement of the proventriculus right here. This is three months of treatment. The bird had improved digestion, improved body weight, and improved body condition. Look at the proventriculus. It almost looks normal. We caught this bird early because this man was attuned to PDD or avian ganglion neuritis in his aviary. And uh, we got the bird on early treatment. And that's really, but, but really Let important. me just, just point out with those that, <clears throat> that what you're seeing here is that the GI tract has literally changed because the nerves are allowed to function normally. When you reduce the inflammation of those T cell infiltrates, those lymphocytes around the ganglia that are just beating the shit out of the darn things, um, then, then, the, then the nerves function, they're sending information to the, the muscle cells and the GI tract, the muscular layer goes back to its normal state and its ability to function goes back to its normal state. I just want to make sure, you know, since we have a number of people on, I want them to understand that. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Okay, so what, what Dr. Rose is referring to is the D innervation atrophy. If you take the nerve mm -hmm. and you cut that, that supplies a muscle, you cut that nerve, that muscle will atrophy. And that's basically what causes the muscle wall to weaken and the proventriculates and for the muscle wall to dilate. Okay, so let's talk briefly about treatment. We have a lot of veterinarians that like meloxicam because it's good excuse me, readily available. It's a COX-2 selective inhibitor. And that's important to keep in mind because it does inhibit some of the COX-1 enzyme. And that's very important in a ga as a gastric cryoprotectant. We've got a, a question, I think, uh, on that. The other thing, it was orally formulated for the dog and cat, the GI tract. And uh, Susan, you can comment on this, that that the avian digestive tract is more acidic. Is that correct? No, it's more basic. More basic. So, okay. so, yeah, yeah. So the dog and cat tract is is more acidic, and and the the digestion process is going to be very different. So and it's going to be really different, right? In a bird that has problems with that dorsal nu vagal nucleus and the 10th cranial nerve going that's that's supplying the stomach of the bird. And when that gets all mixed up, then you have a change in the ability to digest. And then you subsequently then have a, a change in the ability to absorb. So, so go on, Bob, because that leads to robenococcus. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's true. And uh, we'll just report, there, there was one report where they actually used meloxicam and cockatiels and reported that their clinical disease got worse with the treatment. And uh, again, we're dealing with a species that we normally don't see clinical disease in. And secondly, a species in which we've exposed to a very, very high level of virus that they normally will not be exposed to in their normal daily life. So that brings us on to Rubenicox or We find this to be very, very helpful in treating birds with ganglioneuritis. We'll treat them once every five to seven days, two to 10 milligrams per kilograms for a month to a month and a half. So once a week for four to six weeks. Um, I have used higher doses with birds. Some of these birds that are really ataxic, really are grays that are having seizures, consistent seizure activity. Um, I've upped the dose to 20 megs per kg in severe cases, and this we find to be very effective. Um, Dr. Oros found that with Celebrex in birds with central nervous system disease, you have to really increase the dose to get it right. across the blood-brain barrier to have an impact on the inflammatory process that's occurring. So, so the advantage, everyone, is that this 
is an intramuscular injection. So it bypasses a GI tract that might not be working exactly. well. So from an absorption perspective, you have a different thing that happens. I found as your bird gets smaller, we'll, we probably have to change the dosing interval to about every three days. So um, it, it just depends on the bird's size and its metabolism. So it, it's something that we have to watch because we have only one study um, from out of Belgium that looks at uh, robenococcib and looks at uh, Celebrex. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and in the case of Celebrex, the half-life is really short. So when people say to me, well, I gave it, I could get it, it once a day. That ain't gonna work. Because mm -hmm. it's gone from the body in, in citizen birds within six hours, six to eight hours. So you've got to give it at least twice a day. Exactly, correct. So do you want to talk about gabapentin here? Yeah, I, 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 I want gabapentin to work really well, but it, it just depends. It's very individualized in terms of the patient mm -hmm. um, from a neuritis perspective. It's used for sharp burning pain, particularly it's been used in, in diabetics that have neuritis associated with, di with diabetes. And it's also been used for pain associated with uh, fractures, uh, which cause problems with the vertebral column and uh, herpes lesions where you get these, these really painful neuropathies. So. I have used it. I have to tell you that I use it at a higher dose than a lot of my colleagues do. Um, but it, I, it also is very important how it's formulated. So those are things that you have to look at and, and address when you're when you're dealing with your bird and your particular situation. It might work really well for you and your because of your bird will to tolerate it very well and will work. And in some birds, it won't work. The other thing that it's used for is for seizure control. I have several birds on gabapentin. I also have other birds on Keppra. So it can be used for those as well. And then I'll, I'll kind of talk about this a little bit. Um, I've kind of been the person after having to get grilled by Helga Gerlach about the egg issue, because um, that was unfortunately me. Um, that we don't entirely understand this. We're going to talk about that in a question coming up. But oftentimes, my question to you as the owner and what you need to think about is when you start to see signs, some neurologic signs, what could they be? Uh, toe tapping, uh, wing flipping, um, a falling off the perch, um, dazzled or startled often, there's a whole host of things. It can be from born virus, it can be from other things. But one of the things that you need to make sure that you think about is what happened immediately preceding this. Did the bird start to have an increase in its hormones? Um, you know, were, was it more hormonally active? Um, because for for a lot of these birds, because I use this as my hypothesis, I found that I can slow down some of these symptoms in birds where we give Lupron or Desirel in implants. Go ahead, even though I'm not supposed to say that we do. <laughs> yeah, we find that very, very helpful. Um, the other thing I, I think that we're looking at, and there was a question I think we'll come into later on here about future treatments and more and more we're hearing how important the intestinal microbiome is. This is the community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that are present within that digestive tract. And it's very, very important to the homeostasis of the organism, both from an immune system function and a nervous system function. A lot of these birds with avian ganglion enteritis have an altered intestinal microbiome, and we'll see overgrowth with yeasts. Uh, Clostridium is a real common one due to the slow movement of, of ingested throughout that digestive tract, avian gastric yeast also. And so managing the microbiome, trying to, trying to keep that normalized, 
Um, Visbiome Vet is, an, is a product that's available here in the U.S. Uh, Savoy, I think, is another really good product. That's very, very important um, as far as managing birds with ganglion neuritis. Okay, with that, I'd like to make a few comments about vaccination. Um, and there was just a, a, a very short uh, study. Uh, it was kind of a rudimentary study about with a crude uh, avian borne viral extract. And um, they inoculated birds. Again, we're talking about um, cockatiels where we don't normally see the disease and uh, exposing these birds to levels of virus that far exceed what they would normally be exposed to. And what we can, uh, the, 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 I guess the conclusions we can make from that study is that the vaccine, it appears to protect against clinical signs and the development of histopathologic lesions in birds that are not in fact infected with avian bornavirus, okay? And it's also very safe and easy to perform two IM injections. And with those two IM injections, it produced anti bornaviral injections. And if you take a naive bird that expose them to the virus, um, it will protect them against clinical disease, okay? The problem that we deal with is that we believe that the majority of these birds are infected with the virus vertically through the egg. And I think more and more we're finding that that's probably a major route of transmission of avian borne virus. So, I mean, if the bird's already infected, um, you know, when you give the vaccine, it will not confer from these studies any protection in birds that are already infected with avian borne virus. The other thing is in these birds that are already infected, it does not stop viral replication spread throughout the tissues, and it does not stop shedding of the virus in infected birds. So you get these birds that hatch out with born virus, the vaccine really, I don't think it's gonna be very effective. It will only help to prevent ganglion neuritis caused by avian born virus in non-infected birds. And uh, I think therein lies the problem with vaccination. Okay, so let's get to some uh, questions here that we had. We'll have to hurry through this. Uh, first one, is it more of a syndrome versus a disease? I think it's more accurately called a disease because a disease is a clinical condition with a defined cause or reason behind it. A syndrome refer refers to a group of symptoms without a real identifiable cause. So avian borne virus, avian ganglion neuritis is a disease. Okay. Um, Susan, I don't know who's supposed to handle these, you or me, but we'll, we'll just go and just no, chime you, you in. Keep going. Are there, there any diseases in humans yeah. similar to avian ganglion neuritis? Yes. Uh, it's very similar to Gillian Barre, Dr. Rossi, you know, has, has presented this over and over and over. This again is an autoimmune disorder in which the person's own immune system produces antibodies that damage the nervous system, the nerves, by reacting with the ganglioside proteins. Very similar to avian ganglion neuritis or PDD, okay? Okay, I can't, let's see here. Are there any, oh, wait a minute. And we talked about this before, about the fact that the viruses um, are, we're, we're probably binding the virus to macrophages. The macrophages get stimulated and they attack um, these exposed um, parts of the ganglioides. So we have this autoimmune reaction um, because we, we, since we've gone from everything's nice, now we've got viral replication, it turns it over and suddenly that inside, those, those ganglioides are now exposed and then you get this autoimmune reaction. I, I think that next slide shows that, Bob, if you go to the next yeah, slide. That, exactly. Yeah, so here we go. This is a nerve cell, uh, the blood bloodstream here. We get the virus that enters the bloodstream, travels yeah. from the bloodstream to the uh, nerve yeah. cell. It exposes the ganglioside proteins here. We get uh, complement, uh, gets activated. We get macrophages uh, that 
will then recognize this. We get CD8 lymphocytes and macrophages. And then these are sensitized to these nerve gangliosides and they attack other areas uh, of, the, of the nervous system. Right, right. So okay, this is for you, why do birds with coronavirus have low yeah, blood Well, that, and, and let's say, first of all, that, that was a question that was asked, very uncommon, I might add. It's not right. common that the, the glucose goes low, um, but it can happen. Birds have a completely different system in terms of regulating their glucose with glucagon. So the problem it can occur is that essentially they kind of run out of gas, so to speak, because with avian ganglioneuritis, we have a, a change in the digestion as well as the absorption of nutrients in the GI tract. And we lose body condition, we lose uh, reserves, and the blood glucose then can get can get lower. I have seen this more commonly in parallettes um, where there's been a discrepancy, either the blood glucose goes really high and they almost act like they're diabetic or it can get really low. So those two types of things can happen. And I found it more in parallettes. Go ahead, next question. Um, and then we talked about this already about reproduction. Is it hormones directly, indirectly suppressing the immune system or indirectly because of nutrition and reproductive behaviors? We're not entirely sure of that. We do know that when the hormone levels normally in a normal bird, when, a, when, the, when the endocrine hormones, the, the gonadal hormones go up, it tends to essentially slightly suppress the immune system of the bird. That's because you've got this egg inside of this bird or you've got sperm cells. So that there's some things called immunologically privileged sites, which we don't want to get into, but it will change the immune system of the bird normally then I believe that this acts as a signal to cause the virus to start replicating. This is my theory, okay? I, it's not, not entirely known yet, but some, some issues with Michael Lewis, this is based on what Helga had told me. So then that immune system too. is, is yeah. changed, right? And by the hor hormonal changes. So if I lower those gonadal hormones, I'm trying to suppress the, re, the, the uh, division of the virus, which should help shut down the problem um, that you see clinically. That, that's why I do what I do. Yeah, next slide. Okay. Uh, this is, it. does it ever, and then I've got something in the way and I can't read, has developed occurred and is always fatal. Can, can you read the top of that? Does yeah. it ever? It says, so does it ever go dormant after the initial infection has developed or occurred? And is it always fatal eventually? And I would say it's not Thank fatal you. eventually. Right. The virus hides out in the cell nucleus and it generally remains in a dormant state. So the majority of birds that are infected with born virus, they will not develop clinical disease. Most infected birds will lead a normal, unaffected life if they're kept in a you know suitable husbandry, suitable nutrition environment. The, the key here that's imperative is early recognition and treatment of the clinical disease. And this provides the best chance for improving the condition of the bird that's suffering from avian ganglion neuritis. Many birds, if caught early, will improve and return to normal. You saw that in that first uh, blue and gold macaw that I treated yeah. with Celebrex. Right. Some will continue to have neurologic signs, but they don't progress. They don't get better, but they don't get worse. And, and some of those will get bad during the hormonal time of the year. And if you know when that's coming, that's when I get make sure they have a Deseron implant or some Depo-Lupron, and then we smooth the whole process out. So it's really bird, that individual bird dependent. That, that's why you got to be on your toes. I have seen that repeatedly. I have one cockatoo three or four years in a row during the breeding season will start to develop neurologic signs. And it's so important. You're right. The desirelin implants to decrease that hormonal activity are real, real helpful. 
Um, we do have a small number of birds that will progress and succumb to disease. And I think in those birds, the ones that I've had problems with that, they're really severely affected. They're diagnosed and treated way too late in the disease process. It's the ganglion neuritis has, has progressed and caused a lot of damage that these birds were just unable to recover from. Or they're very young birds where their immune system just Correct. can't overcome it. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. So the border virus isn't fatal, correct? Yes, it's not necessarily, you know, border viral infection doesn't mean it's fatal. The bird's going to die. Well, and just because it's positive on your test, it's positive on your test, end of story. It may go on and be a problem or it may not, right? I mean, that's most, the point. Most birds will be normal. There, there's kind of this law in nature where if you have a disease that is that is very highly pathogenic and fatal, as we once thought PDD was, you'll find that the incidence of that is very, very low. And contrary to that, if you have a disease where you have a lot of individuals infected, and but the disease incidence is low, when you test, you're going to find uh, a wide presence of that that agent, and that's that's what bornavirus is. Um, it originally thought, you know, we had a bird who's got bornavirus is going to die of PDD, very fatal disease, and not a lot of birds in fact, you know, affected. But what we see now is that the majority, we've got one out of three birds infected with this virus, and most of them are normal. Okay, so again, with uh, a third of our avian population infected. Um, with proper husbandry nutrition, most birds are going to be normal throughout their lifetime. The typical bird with PDD that's emaciated, passing whole seeds, this bird's suffering from advanced disease. And, and, and they don't survive as long as birds that are detected and treated properly early on in the disease process. So early diagnosis and treatment is essential in extending the quality of life in clinically infected birds. Um, the proper treatment, husbandry, nutritional management will extend the quality of life in birds that are infected with avian bornavirus. Most of them you're not going to see a problem with. Okay, so it says here my blue fronted Amazon has been tested for ABV and, gang and uh, AGAA, tested negative for the ganglion neuritis antibody, but positive for bornavirus. What's the difference? Well, Again, the PCR de test detects the avian bornavirus RNA. One out of three birds will test positive. The majority of these birds are clinical normal, clinically normal. A positive PCR does not mean that the bird has avian ganglion neuritis. The AGAA test detects autoantibodies to the nerve ganglia. These birds, uh, uh, basically, this is what causes the associated nerve pathology and the clinical signs observed. The birds having clinical signs that are based in the nervous system dysfunction, the positive AGAA test confirms that avian ganglion neuritis is occurring. And that's the difference between the PCR and the, the antibiotic test. My budgie tested positive for bornavirus, but negative twice on the AGAA. It's been sick with GI tract disease for some time. Is it is the AGA antibody test more accurate than the PCR test where false positives are possible? Well, I need to correct that because false positive tests with the PCR are pretty much almost non-existent. Um, the, the big problem we have is false negatives because the virus is only intermittently shed. It's very unstable outside of the host. Again, at least three negative samples two weeks apart just to have some degree of confidence that the bird is negative. Doesn't mean the bird's negative, but you can reasonably assume that it's negative. The other thing I'll comment on is that, is that clinical uh, avian ganglion neuritis or PDD in budgies is really, really uncommon, as it is clinically in cockatiels. Um, the AGAA test in this bird, especially testing twice, is telling us that the antibodies are not present and therefore, avian ganglion neuritis is most likely not the cause of the digestive tract dysfunction in this bird. And I would really look at other issues. Chronic subclinical chlamydia, for example, is real common in parakeets and lovebirds and some cockatiels. Yeah, and, and, so, and avian uh, gastric yeast too, Bob, avian right? Gastric avian gastric yeast, yes. Yeah. 
So you need to look at some other cause there, although it was negative for AGY here. Um, again, that organism is not consistently shed. Wow. Right. So, um, you know, I would look at something else. Uh, a budgie with I don't, I don't even, I can't even remember if I saw a parakeet or budgie with avian ganglion neuritis. I don't think I have. And the cockatiels I've seen, I could probably count on two hands or less. And yeah. actually, pretty uncommon. Pretty uncommon. Two of those birds were ones that were sensitized to the nerve ganglia size because. We repeated the uh, Rossi's experiment in two birds, and we got these birds were typical. They looked like a macaw with wasting disease. So, and, and I'd add the other thing that you, is chronic low grade heavy metal toxicosis, too. With, exactly. Yes. Yes. Or just a, a bad um, enteritis that hasn't been looked at, uh, parasites, different types of parasites, too, trichomonads, that type of thing. Go ahead. Um, oh, right. it's my turn. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cockatiel tested positive for born <clears throat> born virus, <clears throat> but the results came back after he'd already passed away. Months later, my female cockatiel was diagnosed with PDD after a crop biopsy. My question is, what determines if the if the gastrointestinal system or neurological system will be affected? Should I expect my baby to have a brain affected in the future? Not and, and again, we talked about this before. At this point in time, very few people are doing crop biopsies. Crop biopsies were something that we that we did trying to understand this disease process. And all it did is tell us if the crop was affected. It didn't tell us the other parts of the body neurologically were affected. And as Bob says here, there are different types of gangliosides that are specific for the nervous system, about 50 of those. And they're distributed variably um, through the nervous system. And the Borna virus is going to affect certain ones. So, and, and as he said, there's also the molecular mimicry issue that occur. So your bird um, having that is, is most likely going to be affected by the GI tract and if you keep this bird's immune system healthy and you keep its hormones down, it may not spread through the rest of the body. Okay. Uh, rest of the nervous system is what I mean to say. Next. Okay. I think we're out of time, but we should keep going. And this okay, just we'll shows go, again. Yeah. 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 So let's go on to the next one because we're getting. Like, okay, so all this shows is the various bacteria and the different viruses and right. the uh, gangliocyte proteins, the GM1, GT1B, GT1A, that they mimic, that autoantibodies to these will, will mimic. Okay. And then so, the next one is a 10-year-old uh, cape. Um, and, when it, and when they sold the bird 10 years ago, it, it came back positive for avian borna virus um, because... Um, the problem was that everybody didn't realize that just because they're positive for coronavirus means they have coronavirus. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that they're going to get sick from it. It doesn't mean they're going to get PDD from it. And so um, the buyer was co concerned about PDD. But remember, again, that is just a term for dilation of the proventriculus. Um, and so if you want to, as Dr. Bob is telling you, if you want to look at the bird in terms of, does it, is it creating autoantibodies, which is more suggestive of disease process, you would want to have the AGAA test. Most birds with coronavirus live normal lives. And, they, and as I say to my clients, they get the opportunity to die from something else. Exactly. Go Good point. <laughs> Okay. And then, and then this can't. is the one about the hyacinth macaw. Why don't you Why don't you go ahead with that one? Okay, I, I can't read the top line. Okay, so uh, it says there's it a seventeen year old. Yeah. So it was a hyacinth with gangrene. Right, and it had okay. gangrene neuritis. We first noticed a distinct imbalance and loss of grip in his feet, which is associated. I'm going to say that will be the the result of either the peripheral nervous system not sending the information to the cerebellum or the cerebellum is not functioning properly. Um, and our avian vet tested for uh, 
avian borne virus, it was negative, uh, along with Hattie V metal. They did uh, x-rays, MRI, and CT scan scans. Eventually, he was positive for the AGAA test. Um, they treated the bird with meloxicam and gabapentin. Um, and so from our perspective, um, I, I don't think that was the way to approach it. I we agree. know much better. Um, I, could we have saved the bird? <clears throat> Probably not. No. <clears throat> but we, we could have used, we, Bob and I would have used robenicoxib injectably. Um, we might want to speed up the GI tract with metoclopramide injectably to try to get the GI tract running better. Um, we want to do these things that are anti-inflammatories, and so we would have we would have changed our plan. It would have been a different plan. But but I don't want you to say, "Oh God, I should have done something differently." It's a lovely bird. It passed away. Probably robenicoxib would not have helped. It's a sad situation, but uh, again, yeah. I think the fact that it was negative for Borna virus. Yeah, you know, you don't eliminate avian ganglion neuritis as what's going on in that bird. Again, early institution of proper treatment and management is really essential in extending the quality of life in affected birds. The sooner you get diagnosed, the sooner you treat them, and the more properly you treat them, the better chance they have. Okay, so she, she this is a lady, who, or uh, somebody, who has a macaw that's sick. She was tested positive for Bornavirus and the antibodies, which are the AGAA tests. Um, she's on Celebrex and Gabapentin and having seizures since she was one years old. She's now six. This is, this is where we start asking questions about when do they occur. I can tell you what happens in my area when, when macaws are going to potentially be hormonal. They're going to, they're going to have a hormonal blip in July. They're going to have another one in um, November-ish through in January, late. February. Yes. Um, so I would be thinking about, let's keep, keep the hormones down. Uh, let's think about robenicoxib during times when, and, and how often are we seizuring? Um, if gabapentin is not working, it might be working really well. Another option would be Kepra. Next question, because we're behind. Okay, so um, uh, large, has a large swollen crop, air field. I don't know what kind of bird this is. Uh, wasn't a fungal infection. Is this an indication of PDD? Let's call it avian ganglioneuritis. Um, Amen. Uh, okay, uh, there were no neurologic symptoms. There was muscle wasting, but no diarrhea. It was fed pellets, no seeds, so no seed in the feces. Broke was a cockatiel. Again, as Bob and I are saying, um, it also had a swollen proventricus. I, this bird, to me, doesn't say, man, I think this is born a virus. This, this bird, we, it could Great. be avian ganglioneuritis, but it, there's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of reasons that can do this. Now, and some of these bigger birds, like let's say you said it was a macaw, a little bit more likely. <clears throat> and, and, and some of these, you know, can have a lot of them, even a macaws, I had macaws that have really bad avian gastric yeast infections also associated with the reproductive time. So there's something going on. And even if it tests positive, for AGAA, that doesn't mean it's the only thing. Let's let's do a good job with our diagnostics. Okay, go ahead. Good CBC and Kemp panel. Yep, yep. Okay, so in the 80s, I, I had a bird, I had some African grays that had um, uh, their first symptom looked like their nails were too long and they get caught in the aviator wire, uh, but the nails were fine. Um, they're, they're, they were growing rapidly. Um, this could be from, uh, you know, let's pretend that this is, this was finally diagnosed that it was avian uh, born a virus in the eighties. It wouldn't have been uh, that, but it, it was diagnosed back then as PDD. So why would this happen? This could be because um, you have nerve supply and vascular supply then 
changes that can either be because there's the, the virus likes to go after a certain layer, the molecular cell, cell layer of the cerebellum, that's one area. It can also be in the thoracolumbar spinal cord and it affects those motor neurons going to the legs. The other reason, which I didn't put here because I just thought about it, um, was that remember Dr. Bob said really, really early, if you were paying attention, uh, he talked about, um, about the, the, the adrenal gland. And so the adrenal gland will also affect uh, growth of nails. And we see that a lot in ferrets where their nails grow rapidly when their adrenal glands are on the blank. Okay, next question. Um, okay, sorry. That's good here. If one of ours doesn't have to be the precursor to PDD, it's possible to test for ganglion antibodies for diagnosis. The answer is yes. The AGAA test provides the best confirmation of avian ganglion virus in infected bird. We know other viruses can induce anti-ganglion site antibodies. Some intestinal bacteria can do as we, we demonstrated. They can cross-react with the neural ganglion sites. Basically, any of these can induce clinical disease that is indistinguishable from PDD or avian borne viral disease. What's best test for AGN borne virus, best type of sample? Bortovirus PCR, cloacal swab, and whole blood are best. Remember that the virus is unstable and degrades very rapidly. Even a strong positive sample can test negative seven days post-collection. Um, we do test the blood, too. We actually, back years ago, developed some techniques for picking up uh, circovirus in the blood of birds. Back when we started the testing in 91, and we applied those techniques for um, avian bornovirus. And the, we often find many samples that are negative on the clinical swab, but positive on blood. But even a negative on either one of the, both of those does not mean the bird doesn't have it. But um, you know, that's why we suggest both. For the uh, antibody assay, the AGAA, small amount of clear serum or plasma. Um, ideally, we'd like it to be free of blood cells. We get a lot of samples that are loaded with blood and you get a little bit of serum on the top. I really think those blood cells interfere. We try to spin them down. It takes extra work and, you know, but, but whole blood itself is not suitable for testing. It's got to be, you know, the clearer the serum, the better. And, and again, the AGA test helps confirm the diagnosis of avian ganglionitis. The bornoviral PCR test does not do this. It only confirms the presence of avian bornovirus RNA. Is it only available in the US? No, Dr. Rossi, who invented the assay, offers it to the European community through the University of Camerino in Italy. The assay is licensed here in the US. We're under license with the University of Camerino, and the assay is patented under a world and a US patent. Can you give us an update on research? Uh, my female green cheek Conyers neurologic symptoms, loss of balance, seizures. She's taken phenobarb and Onsior. Uh, again, I think the real yeah, problem. Yeah, right, oh, right. I ahead, think, uh, yeah, I think we're, we've run, we're kind of run out of time and we can post yeah. all these answers. But but the, the problem that um, someone asked us just recently is, well, how much of this, you know, what kind of federal funding is involved and why is the research old and why is this? I think, and I think this is a, no. yeah, I think, well, th th it's, it's in here general. somewhere. But, but the point is, there is no federal, let me repeat this, there is no federal funding for any of this research. There is funding in Europe with different countries, okay? A lot of what Bob has done has come out of his own pocket. Most of what we're reporting to you has been from Europe because those countries will support research in, in, in parrots and in birds. Our country does not. We and actually, as a former researcher at the University of Tennessee, there was nothing funded, nothing. It doesn't matter what it was, it wasn't funded. It was funded, a lot of it, and my research was funded by the Lefebvre Company. Thank you, Lefebvre Company, for funding all that research. But, um, 
but but that's some of the grants to AAV potentially or universities with small amounts of money and small donations. And that's how a lot of this is done. I'm sorry, Laura, we've taken too much of your time. Should we continue, Laura, or? Should we stop? I've lost that's okay. you. Uh, that's a fascinating, um, uh, it's an important topic to cover. You guys have covered it very, uh, so. Oop, we've lost her. So, um, oh, did you, did you lose me? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay, I just wonder, I, I, it was well worth going over because it's a very topic and um, really appreciate your insight and both of you joined us today for that. Um, so no, no worries then, about going over because it's a important topic. Yeah, yeah, and, and so the other thing you, is, uh, uh, Laura, we there's a few more left, but Bob and I have written out answers. So if the whole thing is put up for on your YouTube, then if we've missed there, there's a couple more questions so but those answers will be on that okay so that people can look at that okay thank you very much yeah, um yeah and also just to remind our participants today that if you miss uh our, that we also have part one on the youtube channel so you can watch the uh, the first presentation that uh, that was given on uh, by dr susan here uh you can go on the, the youtube let people uh, let people's youtube channel and see that and this will also be on a recording of this and with that said, I'm going to announce today's uh, winner of our giveaway. It's the uh, top furniture berries, uh, as well as a product of your bird's choice from the paper. And that is going to go out to Donald Wheeler. So thank you, um, Donald, uh, for joining us. And hopefully your bird will enjoy that. Um, and also <laughs> a sneak peek. Next Friday, we're back on with uh, Dr. Tom Tolley, Ask the Vet. So if you, um, if you have a question about your health, uh, we'll be answering those questions live next Friday. So uh, on that, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much for uh, a very in-depth. Uh, and also, you know, when the, when you watch this on the YouTube channel, you can see these slides um, again. So um, thank you, Dalhausen. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reese. Uh, we will see you hopefully uh, in the future on a future thank one. You. So thank you very much thank for your you. time. And, yeah. and I know it was a lot, of, a lot of science, but if you go through back through it and you look at some of this stuff, I, I think it'll make a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Paper. On, on that, everybody, uh, have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock, and everyone stay safe. Thank you. Bye.